The Compart 2 By Aristotle Audiobook 33x44 The penis of the elephant resembles that of the horse, compared with the size of the animal it is, dis it is disproportionately small, the testicles are not visible, but are concealed inside in the vicinity of the kidneys, and for this reason the male speedily gives over in the act of intercourse. The genitals of the female are situated where the udder is in cheap, when she is in heat, she draws the organ back and exposes it externally, to facilitate the act of intercourse for the male, and the organ opens out to a considerable extent. With most animals the genitals have the position above assigned, but some animals discharge their urine backwards, as the lynx, the lion, the camel, and the hare. Male animals differ from one another, as has been said, in this particular, but all female animals are retromingent. Even the female elephant like other animals, though she has the privi part below the thighs. In the male organ itself here is a great diversity. For in some cases the organese composed off flesh and gristle, as in men, in such cases, the fleshy part does not become inflated, but the gristly part is subject to enlargement. In other cases, the organ is composed of fibrous tissue, as with the camel and the deer, in other cases it is bony, as with the fox, the wolf, the marten, and the weasel, for this organ in the weasel has a bone. When man has arrived at maturity, his upper part is smaller than the lower one, but with all other blooded animals the reverse holds good. By the upper part we mean all extending from the head down to the parts used for excretion of residuum, and by the lower part else. With animals that have feet the hind legs are to be rated as the lower part in our comparison of magnitudes, and with animals devoid of feet, the tail, and the like. When animals arrive at maturity, their properties are as above stated, but they differ greatly from one another in their growth towards maturity. For instance, man, when young, has his upper part larger than the lower, but in course of growth he comes to reverse this condition, and it is owing to this circumstance that an exceptional instance, by the way he does not progress in early life as he does at maturity, but in infancy creeps on all fours, but some animals, in growth, retain the relative proportion of the parts, as the dog. Some animals at first have the upper part smaller and the lower part larger, and in course of growth the upper part gets to be the larger as is the case with the bushy-tailed animals such as the horse, for in their case there is never, subsequent lito birth, any increase in the part extending from the hoof to the haunch. Again, in respect to the teeth, animals differ greatly both from one another and from man. All animals that are quadrupedal, blooded, and viviparous, are furnished with teeth, but, to begin with, some are double-toothed, or fully furnished with teeth in both jaws, and some are not. For instance, horned quadrupeds are not double-toothed, for they have not got the front teeth in the upper jaw, and some hornless animals, also, are not double-toothed, as the camel. Some animals have tusks, like the boar, and some have not. Further, some animals are saw-toothed, such as the lion, the pard, and the dog and some have teeth that do not interlock but have flat opposing crowns, as the horse and the ox, and by saw-toothed we mean such animals as interlock the sharp-pointed teeth in one jaw between the sharp-pointed ones in the other. No animal is there that possesses both tusks and horns, nor yet do either of these structures exist in any animal possessed of saw-teeth. The front teeth are usually sharp, and the back ones blunt. The seal is saw-toothed throughout, inasmuch as he is a sort of link with the class of fishes, for fishes are almost all saw-toothed. No animal oft his genera is provided with double rows of teeth. There is, however, an animal oft sort, if we are to believe Tizias. He assures us that the Indian wild beast called the Mardic Horus has a triple row of teeth in both upper and lower jaw, that it is as big as a lion and equally hairy and that its feet resemble those of the lion, that it resembles man in its face and ears, that its eyes are blue, and its color vermilion, that its tail is like that of the land scorpion, 
that it has a sting in the tail, and has the faculty of shooting off arrowwise the spines that are attached to the tail, that the sound of fits. Voice is a something between the sound of a panpipe and that of a trumpet, that it can run as swiftly as deer, and that it is savage and a man-eater. Man sheds his teeth, and so do other animals, as the horse, the mule, and the ass. And man sheds his front teeth, but there is no instance of an animal that sheds its molars. The pig sheds none of its teeth at all. With regard to dogs some doubts are entertained, as some contend that they shed no teeth whatever, and others that they shed the canines, but those alone, the fact being, that they do shed their teeth like man, but that the circumstance escapes observation, owing to the fact that they never shed them until equivalent teeth have grown within the gums to take the place of the shed ones. We shall be justified in supposing that the case is similar with wild beasts in general, for they are said to shed their canines only. Dogs can be distinguished from one another, the young from the old, but their teeth, for the teeth in young dogs are white and sharp pointed, in old dogs, black and blunt. In this particular, the horse differs entirely from animals in general. For, generally speaking, as animals grow older their teeth get blacker, but the horse's teeth grow whiter whitish. The so-called canines come in between he sharp teeth and the broad or blunt ones, partaking of the form of both kinds, for they are broad at the base and sharp at tip. Males have more teeth than families in the case of men, sheep, goats, and swine, in the case of odor animals observations have not yet been made. But the more teeth they have the more long-lived are they, as a rule, while those are short-lived in proportion that have teeth fewer in number and thin lie set. The last teeth to come in man are molars called wisdom teeth, which come at the age of 20 years, in the case of both sexes. Cases have been known in women upwards. Of 80 years old where at the very close of life the wisdom teeth have come up, causing great pain in their coming, and cases have been known of like phenomenon in men too. This happens, when it does happen, in the case of people where the wisdom teeth have not come up in early years. The elephant has four teeth on either side, by which it munches its food, grinding it like so much barley meal, and, quite apart from these, it has its great teeth, or tusks, two in number. In the male these tusks are comparatively large and curved upwards, in the female, they are comparatively small and point in the opposite direction, that is, they look downwards towards the ground. The elephant is furnished with teeth at birth, but the tusks are not invisible. The tongue of the elephant is exceedingly small, and situated far back in the mouth, so that it is difficult to get a sight of it. Furthermore, animals differ from one another in the relative size of their mouths. In some animals the mouth opens wide, as is the case with the dog, the lion, and with all the saw-toothed animals, other animals have small mouths, as man, and others have mouths of medium capacity, as the pig and his congeners. The Egyptian hippopotamus has a mane like a horse, is cloven-footed like an ox, and is snub-nosed. It is a hucklebone like cloven-footed animals, and tusks just visible, it has the tail of a pig, the neigh of a horse, and the dimensions of an ass. The hide is so thick that spears are made out of it. In its internal organs it resembles the horse and the ass. Some animals share the properties of man and the quadrupeds, as the ape, the monkey, and the baboon. The monkey is a tailed ape. The baboon resembles the ape in form, only that it is bigger and stronger, more like a dog in face, and is more savage in its habits, and its teeth are more dog-like and more powerful. Apes are hairy on the back in keeping with their quadrupedal nature, and hairy on the belly in keeping with their human form fur, as was said above. This characteristic is reversed in men and the quadruped only that the hair is coarse, so that the ape is thickly coated both on the belly and on the back. Its face resembles that of man in many respects, in other words, it has similar nostrils and ears, and teeth like those of man, both front teeth and molars. Further, 
whereas quadrupeds in general are not furnished with lashes on one of the two eyelids, this creature has them on both, only very thin lysette, especially the under ones, in fact they are very insignificant indeed. And we must bear in mind that all other quadrupeds have no under eye lash at all. The ape has also inits chest two teats upon poorly developed breasts. It has also arms like man, only covered with hair, and it bends these legs like man, with convexities off both limbs facing one another. In addition, it has hands and fingers and nails like man, only that all these parts are somewhat more beast-like in appearance. Its feet are exceptional in kind. Thetis, the are like large hands, and the toes are like fingers, with the middle one the longest of all, and the under part of the foot is like a hand except for its length, and stretches out towards the extremities like the palm oft hand, and this palmet after end is unusually hard, and in a clumsy obscure kind of way resembles a heel. The creature uses its feet either as hands or feet and doubles them up as one doubles a fist. Its upper arm and thigh are short in proportion to the forearm and the shin. It has no projecting navel, but only a hardness in the ordinary locality of the navel. Its upper part is much larger than its lower part, as is the case with quadrupeds, in fact, the proportion of the former to the latter is about as 5 to 3. Owing to this circumstance and to the fact that its feet resemble hands and are composed in a manner offhand and offoot. Offoot in heel extremity, offhand in all else for even the toes have what is called a palm for these reasons the animal is oftener to be found on all fours than upright. It has neither hips, inasmuch as it is a quadruped, nor yet a tail, inasmuch as it is a biped, except nor yet a tall bith with a tithe is a tail as small as small can be, just a sort of indication of a tail. The genitals of the female resemble those of the female in the human species, those of the male are more like those of a dog than are those of a man. The monkey, as has been observed, is furnished with a tail. In all such creatures the internal organs are found under dissection to correspond to those of men. So much then for the properties of the organs of such animals as bring forth their young into the world alive. Oviparous and blooded quadruped sand, by the way, no terrestrial blooded animal is oviparous unless it is quadrupedal or is devoid of feet altogether are furnished with a head, a neck, a back, upper and under parts, the front legs and hind legs, and the part analogous to the chest, all as in the case of viviparous quadrupeds, and with a tail, usually large, in exceptional cases small. And all these creatures are many-toed, and the several toes are cloven apart. Furthermore, they all have the ordinary organs of sensation, including gautung, with the exception of the Egyptian crocodile. This latter animal, by the way, resembles certain fishes. For, as a general rule, fishes have a prickly tongue, not free inits movements though there are some fishes that present a smooth undifferentiated surface where the tongue should be, until you open their mouths wide and make a close inspection. Again, oviparous blooded quadrupeds are unprovided with ears, but possess only the passage for hearing, neither have they breasts, nor a copulatory organ, nor external testicles, but internal ones only, neither are they hair-coated, but are in all cases covered with scaly plates. Moreover, they are without exception saw-toothed. River crocodiles have pig's eyes, large teeth and tusks, and strong nails, and an impenetrable skin composed of scaly plates. They see but poorly under water, but above the surface of it with remarkable acuteness. As a rule, they pass the daytime on land and the nighttime in the water, for the temperature of the water is at nighttime more genial than that of open air. The chameleon resembles the lizard in the general configuration of its body, but the ribs stretch downwards and meet together under the belly as is the case with fishes, and the spine sticks up as with the fish. Its face resembles that of the baboon. Its tail is exceedingly long, terminates in a sharp point, and is for the most part coiled up, like a strap of leather. 
It stands higher off the ground than the lizard, but the flexure of the legs is the same in both creatures. Each of its feet is divided into two parts, which bear the same relation to one another that the thumb and the wrist of the hand bear to one another in man. Each of these parts is for a short distance divided after a fashion into toes, on the front feet the inside part is divided into three and the outside into two, on the hind feet the inside part into two and the outside into three, it has claws also on these parts resembling those of birds of prey. Its body is rough all over, like that of the crocodile. Its eyes are situated in a hollow recess, and are very large and round, and are enveloped in a skin resembling that which covers the entire body, and in the middle a slight aperture is left for vision, through which the animal sees, for it never covers up this aperture with the cutaneous envelope. It keeps twisting its eyes round and shifting its line of vision in every direction, and thus contrives to get a cytophany object that it wants to see. The change in its color takes place when it is inflated with air, it is then black, not unlike the crocodile, or green like the lizard but black spotted like the pard. This change of color takes place over the whole body alike, for the eyes and the tail come alike under its influence. In its movements it is very sluggish, like the tortoise. It assumes a greenish hue in dying, and retains this hue after death. It resembles the lizard in the position of the esophagus and the windpipe. It has no flesh anywhere except a few scraps of flesh on the head and on the jaws and near to the root of the tail. It has blood only round about the heart, the eyes, the region above the heart, and in all the veins extending from these parts, and in all these there is but little blood after all. The brain is situated a little above the eyes, but connected with them. When the outer skin is drawn aside from off the eye, a something is found surrounding the eye, that gleams through like a thin ring of copper. Membranes extend well nigh over its entire frame, numerous and strong, and surpassing in respect of number and relative strength those found in any other animal. After being cute open along its entire length it continues to breathe for a considerable time, a very slight motion goes on in the region of the heart, and, while contraction is especially manifested in the neighborhood of the ribs, a similar motion is more or less discernible over the whole body. It has no spleen visible. It hibernates, like the lizard. Birds also in some parts resemble the above-mentioned animals, that is to say, they have in all cases a head, a neck, a back, a belly, and what is analogous to the chest. The bird is remarkable among animals as having two feet, like man, only, by the way, it bends them backwards as quadrupeds bend their hind legs, as was noticed previously. It has neither hands nor front feet, but wings an exceptional structure as compared with other animals. Its haunch bone is long, like a thigh and is attached to the body as far as the middle of the belly, so like to a thigh is it that when viewed separately it looks like a real one, while the real thigh is a separate structure betwixt it and the shin. Of all birds those that have crooked talons have the biggest thighs and the strongest breasts. All birds are furnished with many claws, and all have the toes separated more or less asunder, that is to say, in the greater part the toes are clearly distinct from one another for even the swimming birds, although they are web-footed, have still their claws fully articulated and distinctly differentiated from one another. Birds that fly high in air are in all cases four-toed. That is, the greater part have three toes in front and one behind in place of a heel, some few have two in front and two behind, as the wryneck. This latter bird is somewhat bigger than the chaffinch, and is modeled in appearance. It is peculiar in the arrangement of its toes, and resembles the snake in the structure of its tongue, for the creature can protrude its tongue to the extent of four finger breadths, and then draw it back again. Moreover, it can twist its head backwards while keeping all the rest of its body still, like the serpent. It has big claws, somewhat resembling those of the woodpecker. Its note is a shrill chirp. Birds are furnished with a mouth, but with an exceptional one, for they have neither lips nor teeth, but a beak. 
neither have they ears nor a nose, but only passages for the sensations connected with these organs. That for the nostrils in the beak, and thought for hearing in the head. Like all other animals they all have two eyes, and these are devoid of flashes. The heavy-bodied, or gallinaceous, birds close the eye by means of the lower lid, and all birds blink by means of a skin extending over the eye from the inner corner, the owl and its congeners also close the eye by means of the upper lid. The same phenomenon is observable in the animals that are protected by horny scuts, as in the lizard and its congeners, for they all without exception close the eye with the lower lid, but they do not blink like birds. Further, birds have neither scuts nor hair, but feathers, and the feathers are invariably furnished with quills. They have no tail, but a rump with tail feathers, short in such as are long-legged and web-footed, large in others. These latter kinds of birds fly with their feet tucked up close to the belly, but the small-rumped or short-tailed birds fly with their legs stretched out at full length. All are furnished with a tongue, but the organ is variable, being long in some birds and broad in others. Certain species of birds above all other animals, and next after man, possess the faculty of uttering articulate sounds, and this faculty is chiefly developed in broad-tongued birds. No oviparous creature has an epiglottis over the windpipe, but these animals so manage the opening and shutting of the windpipe as not to allow any solid substance to get down into the lung. Some species of birds are furnished additionally with spurs, but no bird with crooked talons is found so provided. The birds with talons are among those that fly well, but those that have spurs are among the heavy-bodied. Again, some birds have a crest. As a general rule the crest sticks up, and is composed of feathers only, but the crest of the barn door cock is exceptional in kind, for, whereas it is not just exactly flesh, at the same time it is not easy to say what else it is. Of water animals the genus of fishes constitutes a single group apart from the rest, and including many diverse forms. In the first place, the fish has a head, a back, a belly, in the neighborhood of which last are placed the stomach and viscera, and behind it has a tail of continuous, undivided shape, but not, by the way, in all cases alike. No fish has a neck, or any limb, or testicles at all, within or without, or breasts. But, by the way this absence of breasts may predicate it of all non-viviparous animals, and in point of fact viviparous animals are not in all cases provided with the organ, excepting such as are directly viviparous without being first oviparous. Thus the dolphin is directly viviparous, and accordingly we find it furnished with two breasts, not situated high up, but in the neighborhood of the genitals. And this creature is not provided, like quadrupeds, with visible teats, but has two vents, one on each flank, from which the milk flows, and its young have to follow after it to get suckled, and this phenomenon has been actually witnessed. Fishes, then, as has been observed, have no breasts and no passage for the genitals visible externally. But they have an exceptional organ in the gills, whereby, after taking the water in the mouth, they discharge it again, and in the fins, of which the greater part have four, and the lanky ones too, as, for instance, the eel, and these two situated near to the gills. In like manner the grey mullet as, for instance, the mullet found in the lake at Siphi have only two fins, and the same is the case with the fish called ribbon fish. Some of the lanky fishes have no fins at all, such as the murina, nor gills articulated like those of other fish. And of those fish that are provided with gills, some have coverings for this organ, whereas all the Salakians have the organ unprotected by a cover. And those fishes that have coverings or opercula for the gills have in all cases their gills placed sideways, whereas, among Salakians, the broad ones have the gills down below on the belly, as the torpedo and the ray, while the lankyones have the organ placed sideways, as is the case in all the dogfish. The fishing frog has gills placed sideways, and covered not with a spiny operculum, 
as in all but the Salakian fishes, but with own off skin. Moreover, with fishes furnished with gills, the gills in some cases are simple and others duplicate, and the last gill in the direction of the body is always simple. And, again, some fishes have few gills, and others have a great number, but all alike have the same number on both sides. Those that have the least number have one gill on either side, and this one duplicate, like the boar fish, others have two on either side, one simple and the other duplicate, like the conger and the scarus, others have four on either side, simple, as the elops, the sinagris, the murina, and the eel, others have four, all, with the exception of the hindmost one, in double rows, as the wrasse, the perch, the sheepfish, and the carp. The dogfish have all their gills double, five on a side, and the swordfish has eight double gills. So much for the number of gills as found in fishes. Again, fishes differ from other animals in more ways Thanis regards the gills. For they are not covered with hairs as are viviparous land animals, nor, as is the case with certain oviparous quadrupeds, with tessellated scuts, nor, like birds, with feathers but for the most part they are covered with scales. Some few are rough-skinned, while the smooth-skinned are very few indeed. Of the Selachia some are rough-skinned and some smooth-skinned, and among the smooth-skinned fishes are included the conger, the eel, and the tunny. All fishes are saw-toothed excepting the scarus, and the teeth in all cases are sharp and set in many rows, and in some cases are placed on the tongue. The tongue is hard and spiny and so firmly attached that fishes in many instances seem to be devoid of the organ altogether. The mouth in some cases is wide-stretched, as it is with some viviparous quadrupeds. With regard to organs of sense, all save eyes, fishes possess none of them, neither the organs nor their passages, neither ears, nor nostrils, but all fishes are furnished with eyes, and the eyes devoid of lids, though the eyes are not hard with regard to the organs connected with the other senses, hearing, and smell, they are devoid alike of the organs themselves and of passages indicative of them. Fishes without exception are supplied with blood. Some of Timorae oviparous, and some viviparous, scaly fish are invariably oviparous, but cartilaginous fishes are all viviparous, with the single exception of fishing frog. Of blooded animals there now remains the serpent genus. This genus is common to both elements, for, while most species comprehended therein are land animals, a small minority, to wit the aquatic species, pass their lives in fresh water. There are also sea serpents, in shape to a great extent resembling their congeners of the land, with this exception that the head in their case is somewhat like the head of the conger, and there are several kinds of sea serpent, and the different kinds differ in color, these animals are not found in very deep water. Serpents, like fish, are devoid of feet. There are also sea scolopendras, resembling in shape their land congeners, but somewhat less in regard to magnitude. These creatures are found in the neighborhood of rocks, as compared with their land congeners they are redder in color are furnished with feet in greater numbers and with legs of more delicate structure. And the same remark applies to them as to the sea serpents, that they are not found in very deep water. Of fishes whose habitat is in the vicinity of rocks there is a tiny one, which some call the eshnis, or shipholder, and which is by some people used as a charm to bring luck in affairs of law and love. The creature is unfit for eating. Some people assert that it has feet, but this is not the case. It appears, however, to be furnished with feet from the fact that its fins resemble those organs. So much, then, for the external parts of blooded animals, as regards their numbers, their properties, and their relative diversities. As for the properties of the internal organs, these we must first discuss in the case of the animals that are supplied with blood. For the principal genera differ from animals, in that the former are supplied with blood and the latter are not, and the former include man, 
viviparous and oviparous quadrupeds, birds, fishes, cetaceans, and all the others that come under no general designation by reason of their not forming genera, but groups of which simply the specific name is predicable, as when we say the serpent, the crocodile. All viviparous quadrupeds, then, are furnished with an esophagus and a windpipe, situated as in man, the same statement is applicable to oviparous quadrupeds and to birds, only that the latter present diversities in the shapes of these organs. As a general rule, all animals that take up air and breathe it in and out are furnished with a lung, a windpipe, and an esophagus, with the windpipe and esophagus not admitting of diversity in situation but admitting of diversity in properties, and with lung admitting of diversity in both these respects. Further, all blooded animals have a heart and a diaphragm or midriff, but in small animals the existence of the latter organ is not so obvious owing to its delicate shy and minute size. In regard to the heart there is an exceptional phenomenon observable in oxen. In other words, there is one species of ox where, though not in all cases, a bone is found inside the heart. And, by the way, the horse's heart also has a bone inside it. The genera referred to above are not in all cases furnished with a lung. For instance, the fish is devoid of the organ, as is also every animal furnished with gills. All blooded animals are furnished with a liver. As a general rule blooded animals are furnished with a spleen, but with the great majority of non-viviparous but oviparous animals the spleen is so small as all but to escape observation, and this is the case with almost all birds, as with the pigeon, the kite, the falcon, the owl. In point of fact, the egocephalus is devoid of the organ altogether. With oviparous quadrupeds the case is much the same as with the viviparous, that is to say, they also have the spleen exceedingly minute, as the tortoise, the freshwater tortoise, the toad, the lizard, the crocodile, and the frog. Some animals have a gallbladder close to the liver, and others have not. Of viviparous quadrupeds the deer is without the organ, as also the roe, the horse, the mule, the ass, the seal, and some kinds of pigs. Of deer those that are called acania appear to have gall in their tail, but what is so called does resemble gall in color, though it is not so completely fluid, and the organ internally resembles a spleen. However, without any exception, stags are found to have maggots living inside the head, and the habitat of these creatures is in the hollow underneath root of the tongue and in the neighborhood of the vertebra to which the head is attached. These creatures are as large as the largest grubs, they grow all together in a cluster, and they are usually about twenty in number. Deer then, as has been observed, are without a gallbladder, their gut, however, is so bitter that even hounds refuse to eat it unless the animal is exceptionally fat. With the elephant also the liver is unfurnished with a gallbladder, but when the animal is cute in the region where the organ is found in animals furnished with it, there oozes out a fluid resembling gall, in redder or less quantities. Of animals that take in sea water and are furnished with a lung, the dolphin is unprovided with a gallbladder. Birds and fishes all have the organ, as also oviparous quadrupeds, all to a greater or a lesser extent. Audiobook generated by, read with the ears.